And they say, yeah, no problem, 45 minutes. So I wait and I wait. 50 minutes go by. <laughs> Nobody help me. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 Brooklyn Nine-Nine moments. I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but meow. No, that is not what I was gonna say. Did you just? Mm-hmm. And did you say? Mm-hmm. Dana wasn't buying her own drinks. No. no. For this list, we're looking at the funniest, most heartfelt, and surprisingly dramatic moments from this sitcom. Keep in mind that we will be delving into eight seasons worth of spoilers. What's your favorite Brooklyn Nine-Nine moment? Let us know in the comments. Number 20, Five Singing Suspects. What if the five guys from The Usual Suspects formed a boy band? This uproarious cold open gives us an idea. Although the witness didn't get a good look at the guilty party, she did overhear him singing the perennial Backstreet Boys classic, I Want It That Way. Jake thus decides to have each member of the lineup take a verse. He was singing along to the music at the bar. Do you remember what he was singing? I think it was that song, I Want It That Way. Backstreet Boys, I'm familiar. Okay. Number one, could you please sing the opening to I Want It That Way? Really? Okay. While the setup is ingenious, what really cracks us up is that all five men know the song lyric for lyric and go together in sync. Sorry, wrong boy band. Naturally, Jake can't help but get into the music as well. I want it that way. Tell me why. Ain't nothing but a heartache. Tell the scene is capped off by one of the show's darkest punchlines, bringing Jake back to the harsh reality of being a cop. I want it that way. Oh, chills. Literal chills. It was number five. Number five killed my brother. Oh my god, I forgot about that part. Number 19, Amy late to work. 901, Amy Santiago is officially late for the first time ever. All right, let's do this. Who's got theories? Despite her punctual nature, Detective Amy Santiago finds herself running late to work one day. Each of Amy's co-workers tries to guess why she's tardy. Some of their theories are perfectly plausible, like her three alarms didn't go off. Others are a bit more contrived, involving abduction, alternate dimensions, and mole man sex. Maybe she fell into another dimension where she's interesting. Arriving exactly 70 seconds after 9 o'clock, Amy is forced to explain herself. Turns out there was a long line at the bank, which Captain Holt accurately predicted. Santiago, you will tell us, and you will tell us now. Holt could not be more pleased with himself, cheering victoriously as if he just won the lottery. There was a problem at the bank. Hot damn! Number 18, Sharon's water breaks. Well, Sharon is happy, and Captain Holt has no idea where she is. Damn, we are good at stashing pregnant ladies. While Terry's in the middle of an investigation, Jake and Gina look after his very pregnant wife, Sharon. This entails keeping her away from Captain Holt, who isn't exactly the best conversationalist. Uh, give me one second, Gina. I just want to say hi to Sharon. Just, um, Sharon is gone. Hiding Sharon becomes increasingly difficult, however, when her water breaks. Jake's response to this unexpected development is beyond priceless. Guys? My water just broke. Don't worry about that, we'll just get you another one. Oh, you mean your body water. That's much worse. From there, the episode turns into something of a juggling act, as Jake attempts to comfort Sharon, distance Holt, and deal with an angry horde of perps on Thanksgiving. Do you work here? I do. My son was arrested six hours ago, and nobody can tell me when he's getting out. What is going on? It's a classic example of a little problem that keeps escalating out of control, leading to one big laugh after another. Everyone, I'm going to need you all to clear the room. This woman is having vaginal contractions. It's just contractions. You don't have to add vaginal to it. Number 17, I do my job and I do it right. All right, I see what you're trying to do, but it's not going to work. I'm not going to arrest him. I'm going to arrest him. You won't back up? Yes. They may be complete opposites in many ways, but Detective Jake Peralta and Captain Ray Holt are equally passionate when it comes to serving justice. But someone has been painting wieners on squad cars, <laughs> and apparently they won't stop until there's a penis drawn on every cop car in Brooklyn. After learning that a notorious graffiti artist is Deputy Commissioner Podolsky's son, Jake is given two options. He can either arrest the bratty hooligan or let him off the hook. Jake ultimately chooses to uphold the law, even if it means putting his career at risk. Trevor Podolsky, you're under arrest for vandalism and destruction of property. 
Podolsky vows to make life miserable for Jake and Holt. This is not the first time Holt has stood up to corruption, though. In a few straightforward yet badass words, Holt lets the commissioner know that it will take more than threats to prevent him from doing his job right. Damn, son! You know how I'm still standing here? Because I do my job. And I do it right. Damn, son! Don't say son. Number 16. Discussing the Problem Following everything that went down in 2020, we all wondered how 9-9 would address the George Floyd protests. The season 8 premiere establishes up front that nothing will ever be the same as Rosa quits to become a PI. Oh, that was impressively stupid. I know, right? Uh, so what was it you wanted to tell me? Just wanted to say goodbye. I turned in my resignation. I quit the force. What? Oh! Oh! Ah! The episode effectively explores the nuances of law enforcement, from cops who feel betrayed by the badge to cops who continue to misuse their power, to cops who'd like to change the system but can't, to cops who want to prove they're one of the good ones. And you don't want me going, I'm one of the good ones. And I know how that sounds, but I'm not one of the bad ones who say they're one of the good ones. I'm one of the good ones who say they're one of the good ones. Yeah, I hear it, Rosa. You can stop staring daggers at me. Let's just go. The show acknowledges that these issues can't be resolved in half an hour and probably won't be resolved anytime soon. The episode ends on a somewhat reassuring note, though, as Jake accepts Rosa's decision and his role in the problem. I like to think I've done a lot of good as a detective and that I can continue to do that, but... Maybe I am part of the problem. Number 15. Jake and Rosa's Trial Framed for a bank robbery by the corrupt Lieutenant Hawkins, Jake and Rosa find themselves on the other side of the law. All the evidence points to a guilty verdict, and Gina's commentary doesn't give Jake or Rosa much reassurance. Did you see the robbers' faces? Plain as day. They're sitting right there. The record shows she's pointing at Jake Peralta and Rosa Diaz. Okay, the jurors found that super compelling. Just an update. Thanks, Gina. Rosa decides to run, although Holt convinces her to see the trial through in one of their sweeter exchanges. Jake and Amy find a potential witness who can clear their names, resulting in an epic courtroom entrance. Unfortunately, the surprise witness is in Hawkins' pocket. The outcome is anything but cool, cool, cool. We are not going to jail. We didn't do it. We're innocent. Guilty on all charges. Oh, guilty. Very cool. At the time of filming, the cast and crew were not even sure if they'd get picked up for season five. We shot it and we were like, well, if this is the last episode of the whole series, it's gonna be sucky. Fortunately, this shocking cliffhanger wasn't the end for Jake, Rosa, or the 9-9. Number 14, Gina's Dance. Fine, I guess I can help you with those at-risk kids. <laughs> Whether she's spouting classic one-liners or showing off her outrageous dance moves, Gina Linetti is always a riot. When Amy and Rosa are unable to connect with a group of troubled teens, Gina steps up as an unlikely counselor. Rosa and I think it would be great if you talked to the kids. Mm, I thought only cops could help. In this case, not being a cop might actually be better. Taking center stage, she speaks to her audience through the language of dance. Gina aims to inspire the at-risk kids, but they mainly just find her behavior weird. I think I speak for everyone when I say your weird dancing was just weird. Fortunately, she quickly wins them over upon sharing the perks of being a cop. Cops make $52,000 a year. You never have to stop at a red light. And you get to carry a gun. Who wants in? Boom, 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 boom. Although Gina's dance with Carrie had plenty of pizzazz, this routine simply made us floorgasm. Don't look so sad. Floorgasm is just a rudderless dance ship without you. Number 13, Upsy Downsies. Turn around, clear. Since Die Hard is his favorite movie of all time, it isn't surprising that Jake often fantasizes about being an action hero. During a paintball simulation, Jake channels his alter ego of Rex Buckingham and prepares to win Coolest Kill. Rex Buckingham, at your service. That was majestic. Custom knee pads to help me win Coolest Kill. As Jake and Boyle show off their signature moves, the inept Scully suggests holding your gun upside down as opposed to holding it sideways. Although this seems like an unbelievably stupid idea, it actually gets Jake out of a tough spot. Cornered by the opposing team, Jake starts to lower his weapons. Then, at the last second, he takes his enemies down by going upsy-downsies. Yes, Scully, I went upsy-downsies, and none of you will ever speak of it ever again. 
His final move manages to be funny while also being kick-ass. Maybe Scully could give John McClane a few pointers. You can use that. That will never happen, my American friend. Number 12, Holt and Wunsch. Hello, Raymond. Ray Holt habitually maintains a professional demeanor. However, Deputy Chief Madeline Wunsch knows how to press his buttons. Whenever these two are in the same room, Holt can't help but unleash all of his animosity towards Wunsch. Of course, even then, he still speaks in a hilariously monotone voice. But if you're here, who's guarding Hades? When we first see these bitter rivals together, Holt compares his superior to Hades. And the captain has plenty of other insults lined up for his arch nemesis. Let's begin. On another occasion, he attempts to take the moral high ground, but cannot resist dishing out his epic pun. Lunch time is over. Boom, did it. <laughs> Had it both ways. Since Holt is usually seen as the precinct's stern father figure, it's always fun when he shows off his immature side, especially when Wunsch is involved. You embarrassed yourself in front of Derek Jeter. Number 11, Boyle gets shot in the butt. Ah, what happened? Not my dad. You saved my life. On the surface, Detective Charles Boyle might seem like a bumbling doofus, and sometimes he admittedly is. Regardless, he tries his best and will always come through for his friends. While pursuing a dangerous criminal, Boyle demonstrates his courage and dedication by taking a bullet for Rosa. Oh, hey, bud! It's definitely one of Boyle's most heroic moments, although his gallantry is kind of overshadowed by the fact that he got shot in the buttock. Boyle's a hero, and so is his butt. Nevertheless, Boyle is still rewarded for his bravery with the Medal of Valor. Since this is Charles we're talking about, though, it's only fitting that a horse named Sergeant Peanut Butter steals the show. Oh my god, Charles is getting the same medal as a horse. Number 10, Hitchcock and Scully, 1986. How the hell did two individuals as incompetent as Hitchcock and Scully get onto the force? It's a question that's puzzled even the best detectives, but season six finally provided some insight. The two may be bumbling doofuses now. It was so long ago. I mean, I barely remember how I got to work this morning. I think there was an ambulance involved. Oh, there was. Oh. Back in the 80s, though, Hitchcock and Scully were slicker than Sonny and Rico. They had the moves, the wit, and the studly bods. While the flashback is a stark contrast to the Hitchcock and Scully we know today, a present-day story shows that they still have their ethics and will jeopardize their own well-being to protect an informant. You guys okay? Did you get hit? No, it hit the tub, but the bullet didn't make it through. Hitchcock and Scully are not dirty cops, although their hands are dirty with wing sauce. Remember, kids, it only takes one bite. Uh, what the heck? One wing can't hurt. Number nine, Rosa comes out to her parents. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Diaz. America's favorite couple. Danny Trejo and Olga Meredith as Rosa's parents is pitch perfect casting, although they aren't introduced under the happiest of circumstances. Having recently come out as bisexual, Rosa remains reluctant to tell her mom and dad. She even resorts to enlisting Jake as her boyfriend, but Rosa can no longer conceal the truth after her parents imply that being gay is worse than committing adultery. That's okay. What? You understand. Love is complicated. Wait, why would you be okay with that? Me though, when you called this dinner, you were so nervous, we were worried you were gonna tell us you were gay. Mr. and Mrs. Diaz are convinced that bisexuality doesn't exist, but Rosa assures them that this is who she is. The ending is bittersweet, with Rosa's father making amends, while her mother requires more time. We appreciate that the episode doesn't instantly resolve Rosa's family issues, as it feels more authentic. For the time being, her 9-9 family is there for her. Thank you for doing this, man. Of course. We'll be here every week. Rosa, I broke both your wine glasses in your fridge door in your bathroom. Every single week! Number 8. Full Boil you're going full boil. Charles Boyle has the tendency to rush into relationships, planning extravagant declarations of love after only a few days. As Jake puts it, he goes full boil. I borrowed the waiter's phone when you weren't looking and bought me and Vivian plane tickets to Rome. What? We leave in two hours. 
To make sure Boyle doesn't go overboard with his latest girlfriend, Jake decides to accompany them on their next date. Boyle naturally takes things too far when he decides to buy an engagement ring on the spot. Jake immediately snatches the ring out of Boyle's hand, leading to a standoff with pepper spray. My girl, I'm gonna pepper spray you! Pepper spray me, I will pepper spray you! As Jake disposes of the jewelry, both simultaneously spray each other. In addition to being totally hysterical, this scene exemplifies Jake's affection for Boyle and how far he's willing to go to help his best friend. Number 7. Holt Wins the Bet Last year, you bet me that you could steal my Medal of Valor. And you did. In the show's first Halloween episode, Jake catches Holt off guard by stealing his Medal of Valor and winning their bet. But now it's time for round two of our Halloween bet. The two make a similar bet the following Halloween, as Jake tries to swipe Holt's wristwatch. This time around, though, Holt thinks several steps ahead. In the end, Holt reveals that he's been plotting his revenge for the past year. Enlisting help from the rest of the precinct, Holt not only tricked Jake, but sent him on a wild goose chase as well. So how'd you convince the whole squad to betray me? What'd you offer them? I asked them if they wanted to embarrass you, and they instantly said yes. Not gonna lie, that turns me on a little bit. It's a hilarious turn of events that nobody saw coming, delivering a pitch-perfect punchline. Holt truly earns the title of Amazing Police Captain Slash Genius. Number 6. Jake Proposes to Amy With each Halloween heist, we always wonder how Nine-Nine is going to top itself. I'm already dressed. Well, I'm also dressed. And I made breakfast. Wait, where are my eggs? In my belly. The writers kept upping the ante with twist endings and more characters getting in on the action. By the fifth heist, the audience thought they finally had the formula down. While the hijinks that ensue are chaotic and silly, we'd come to expect that. However, we were not expecting a heist to culminate in one of the show's most romantic moments. I guess my response is, rotten hell, crap face! <gasps> also, I love you and I treasure you, and you bore me. Gosh, you're being so mean. Do it more. I hope you die. With the belt within reach, it appears that either Amy or Jake is going to score their second win. Technically, nobody wins this heist, although it's still a night for Jake and Amy to celebrate. You might want to read the inscription on that there belt. Why? Oh no, what does it say? Amy Santiago, will you marry me? Surprise. Instead of a victory belt, Amy walks away with a ring, while Jake gets a resounding yes. Will you marry me? Jake Peralta, I will marry you. Number 5. Terry is stopped by a cop From the beginning, Nine-Nine didn't shy away from real-world issues, but this Season 4 episode propelled the show to another level. The episode starts pretty much like any other, until Terry goes looking for his daughter's blanket, Moo Moo. Minding his own business, Terry is suddenly stopped by an officer. Assuming that Terry is up to no good based on his skin color, the cop is prepared to arrest him and perhaps worse. What's going on, buddy? Oh, hey, oh, officer. Don't move. Oh, I was just... Step back, keep your hands where I can see him. Drop that. The encounter ends better than it could have, but the fact that Terry was in this position at all demonstrates one of the biggest problems in law enforcement. Although Terry wasn't unfamiliar with profiling, not being able to walk through his own neighborhood at night proved equally eye-opening, heartbreaking, and infuriating. I wasn't a guy who lived in a neighborhood looking for his daughter's toy. I was a black man. A dangerous black man. That's all he could see. A threat. Number 4. Amy Loses the Bet Peralta Santiago, the bet ends today. Are you ready? Throughout the first half of Season 1, Jake and Amy have an ongoing bet involving who can make the most felony arrests. If Amy wins, she gets Jake's car. If Jake wins, Amy has to go on a date with him. For an eight hours, I will win the bet and take Santiago on the worst date in the history of the world. It's a close race, but Jake pulls an upset at the last minute. He takes his victory to the extreme with music, dancing, and confetti. Jake wins, Amy loses. Jake even gets down on one knee and asks the defeated Amy to go on the worst date ever. 
presenting her with a $1 ring. Will you go on the worst date ever with me? You have to say yes. Yes. She said yes! Aside from arguably being the funniest moment on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, this is also the beginning of a beautiful romance. Guess you can add it to your list of bad dates. Nah, it still goes on the good date list. You know, because we caught the bad guys. Number three, saving the Nine-Nine. Shortly before the fifth season ended, Fox canceled Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Many dedicated fans subsequently took to social media, expressing their outrage and sorrow. By the next day, NBC thankfully picked the series up for another season. In a way, a season four episode strangely predicted the future. Attention squad, here's where we stand vis-a-vis -vis whether or not the precinct will be shut down. The precinct will be shut down. What? No. When the precinct risks being shut down, the 9-9 tries to make the most of what might be their last ride. For Gina, that means live streaming her precinct pranks. Ironically, it's Gina's shenanigans that help save the 9-9, as her audience demands the precinct remain open after she shares Holt's touching speech. Loyalty to your friends and fellow officers is important, but more important is our loyalty to this city and its citizens. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, let's go get drunk. So in both real life and the show, fan support kept the 9-9 going. It's funny how life imitates art and vice versa. Number two, Davidson confesses. What are you smiling about? How uncomfortable this guy is. Jacked up the thermostat, got the table all sticky, made one of the chair legs too short, and worst of all, I had Gina greet him. What did you have her do? Be yourself. Of course, son of a bitch. Nine-Nine is one of television's finest ensemble pieces. As such, this bottle episode took a risk by keeping the cast mostly restricted to Jake, Holt, and a suspect named Philip Davidson, played by Sterling K. Brown. The Box ended up being among the show's most well-written and acted episodes, even earning Brown an Emmy nomination. Taking place in an interrogation room, Jake and Holt attempt to squeeze a confession out of Davidson. Although the audience shares their suspicions, Davidson is cool under pressure. It builds to a nail-biting finale, where Davidson's ego gets the best of him. When Jake hammers in the notion that he simply got lucky, Davidson is compelled to explain how he committed the perfect crime at the expense of his freedom. I knew exactly where I was driving. I left my phone in the office on purpose. I was in a surgical suite by design, and I didn't use some glass of wood that any idiot would clearly see was missing. I made a rod out of a special dental polymer, killed him with it, then melted it back down. It's already in a patient's mouth, son! Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Jake and Amy's wedding. But I do have some bad news. There is a bomb at this wedding as well. What? Your butt. Your butt is the bomb. There will be no survivors. Every generation has a TV couple that keeps the audience asking, when are they gonna get together? In some cases, the spark is lost when the couple does finally hook up, but this wasn't at all the case with Jake and Amy. From their first kiss to the birth of their first child, their romance has consistently delivered laughs, heart, and relationship goals. We did it, Ames. We made the world's hottest baby. Say cute, Jake. Nope, this kid is liquid fire. Nowhere is this better demonstrated than on their wedding day, where, of course, everything goes wrong. Sometimes it's the imperfections that make something special, however. With the precinct serving as the venue, Holt officiating, and a robot ring bearer, the wedding isn't what Amy or Jake envisioned. As they say I do, though, they wouldn't trade this moment for anything else. Do you, Amy Santiago, take Jake Peralta to be your husband? I do. And do you, Jake Peralta, take Amy Santiago to be your wife? I absolutely do. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.